Rock and roll. All right. I am sitting here with the main man himself, Prashant, with Real View. Is it, that's the full, is it Real View DD? What, Real what? View Design and Development. Okay. That's how we like to call it. Yeah. But wonderful. So let me take a step back and I'd love uh, to learn about who are you what is, and what is Real View. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, of course. I'm honored to be in the studios of Vesta Preferred Realty. <laughs> worldwide enterprise. Yes, worldwide headquarters. <laughs> so uh, Thank you. I, uh, I really am truly happy and to have the opportunity here. So uh, my name is Prashant Mahakali. I am a licensed architect and um, also a partner in RealView Design and Development. It is a uh, construction company uh, that focuses specifically on new construction uh, projects throughout Chicago and some Chicago land area uh, suburbs, so specifically. Um, I'm here to uh, share some of my wonderful knowledge that was gained over the period of, you know, last seven years. That's, you know, the time when we started Real View and uh, we've been through about going between 80 to 85 to 90 homes so far completed cool. and uh, several in uh, under construction. So uh, ask me anything that uh, you want and I'm like, I'd like to share as much information, make it very useful for your listeners. Perfect. So what I hope today, right? Like I want to demystify new construction, right? I feel like so many people um, feel like it's a massive barrier of entry or they don't understand the economics behind building new construction. But what I found is that with our shifting uh, market, right, tight inventory, all of this, new construction is a way to create your own market, right? Sure. So the way that I'm thinking about it, I have these clients that just, for example, like want to buy a $2 million house, right? And they just cannot find because it's such a tight market yeah. for that. So it, as long as you can understand the economics of like, if you buy this land for, let's call it a million, and you can build a house for a million, like you can do that. Sure. And and and, and explaining and kind of opening up people's eyes that there's other options. And by the way, it's going to be brand new. It's going to be exactly right. what you want. Um, so I'd love to you know just kind of go into the process, sure. um, talk about some pitfalls, and just educate people on what it is like to buy new construction. Like you don't have to like be a multi, multi, multi millionaire to buy sure. new construction. Like I think yeah. like that's the most important thing people need to understand. Got it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes. Since we started the business and we, me and my partner, Fernando, we, we started off with a few renovation projects. We fell flat on our face and the, every time we took on a renovation project, we realized that there is a level of uncertainty that we were not able to control in the project, around the project, and the people of you know involved in the project. So we, as a company, we you know we made a collective decision to stick to new construction because there is there is certain aspects of new construction that are very finite, definite, which is there are only certain things that can go wrong, and as long as you plan for it, you know for the most part you're covered from a builder's perspective. That's why we chose to do only new construction. That's the primary source of all our projects. New type of all of our projects is uh, new construction. Mm -hmm. So the thing about new construction from mm -hmm. there are different perspectives, right? New construction can mean one to a realtor, one to a builder, one to an architect and a buyer. The buyer's perspective is most important because they are the reason why we're all doing this. So from a buyer's perspective, um, and being one myself, you know, a few years ago before, I, which was the impetus for me to start my own company was how bad the experience of buying a new construction home is, especially when you're in the position to make a decision to buy a particular home that is not finished yet. So when we had a bad experience, me and my wife, you know, it left me like very frustrated that. I am in the industry and this is not how, you know, we should be working on building someone's dream home or the experience of them moving into a home should be better than this because this is the most expensive purchase to till that date that, you know, someone's going to about to make. Right. So first thing, new construction fully ready is the best product type that is available. And it's, you can you walk through it, it's fully finished, right. you buy it, you feel happy, nothing's going to break, or it's kind of protected, right? 
That's the best project type. So if you can get to that project type, it's great. The second best is it's almost done and you have you get to have the fun of fin- picking out a few custom finishes, mm-hmm. right? But um, you have to value your own time. A lot of people who want to do new construction but are kind of ske- skeptical of it yeah. was they don't value or know the value of their own time. Like me and my wife, we built our own home during the pandemic. It was a very stressful process for someone like me in the industry, mm-hmm. being the builder myself. The amount of decisions that you have to make over and over and re- reevaluate, question it, redo the, it's just a lot, right? And my wife is an attorney. I'm an architect. We're billing at like super high hourly rates for our clients. You don't even consider that time yeah. you're spending, right? That could easily add to like thousands and thousands of dollars that you could be doing something else. So um, if you you have to be honest with how much time you have yeah. in towards when you're considering a new construction project. Last but not the least, there is the, the granddaddy of all. I want to get a custom home. Yeah. That really is very time intensive and probably the most, you know, challenging for everybody involved mm-hmm. unless you have you're working with someone who has a process that they can lead you into and yeah. lead you out of into a new home right so uh we are trying to get there to that final level where we can say yeah we've done many custom homes it's not always smooth but we understand what the end buyer is looking for right so let's plan for that up front so thank you for all that Right. I think that the number one thing people have to understand when they're going in to buy the new construction. And I always tell this to my buyers whenever, even if it's at that stage where like, for the most part, we're just picking out the final finishes, right? Like you can pick out your countertops, maybe the types of faucets is that I'm like, there's going to be a lot of unknowns that are just going to come at you regardless, no matter how much you try to prepare, plan, you know, I have had clients that are like, well, I'm type A, I know everything, I control okay. everything. I'm like, it's going to be the worst for you. Like, yep. because like, literally, there's just some things you cannot control. control. If I can give you guys a shout out is that um, you guys have hit that on the head almost because you go and like, for example, I, I have clients, right? Yeah, we're, we're talking about building them a new, a new house. And you from the first meeting, we're like, we're going to figure out all of the kinks that I know, right? There's obviously going to be things that pop yeah. up that just you can't control. And then you guys showed us the book that you're going to prepare, right? It was the only thing, the only company that I've ever seen that's done this, okay. where you bring it's, it's and I, you, I'm saying you got to label it and you got to brand yeah. it as your own. It's a little red book, right? Yep. And yep. it's not little, it's huge. Yeah. It's, but you go page by page and it goes down to the type of faucets, faucets yeah. that you have in the bathroom. And you have people be like, you go page by page. Okay. In this room, you're going to have this type of finish and this. Yes. Okay, great. Because that's where people mess up is that, you know, you just like, well, I just want a house. It's like, I, I understand that. But the intricate details room by room, yeah. all the way to the types of lights that you can have to yeah. the types of finishes on the floor, everything that if you don't know from the beginning, it all like starts to come at you all at once. And then it's like, oh my God, I am like, I'm sweating. And then people yeah. get frustrated and then they get mad at you because they weren't planning yeah. it properly or accordingly. And, and now they're they're frustrated. So, you know, they're always pointing at us because we're the ones that always, you know, we're, we're, yeah. it's, it's our fault, right? There needs to be somebody, right? Um, but to, first of all, thank you. I, yeah. It's great to be acknowledged because, you know, we don't end up with other we don't end up showing our process more, you know, enough to for people to understand the effort it goes through to build these every yeah. one of these homes. So the red book that you were mentioning is basically at any point of time, it's like a project manual. It has drawings and specifications of everything that goes inside our home. And at any point, that book acts as a reference for not just one person, for everyone involved in the project. So we leave it sometimes on the project site so that the subcontractors can refer to where does the electrical outlet for this appliance go? Where does mm-hmm. the gas line go? So, or someone can come in from a big stand, picture standpoint and say, how big is this home? And what are the room sizes? So that one book covers and defeats the need for like emails and text messages. And mm-hmm. we were doing that. Hey, can you send me this? What is the dimension? Yeah. So, Which is the normal way it goes. And it's correct. just like, and then things get lost in the lost, shuffle. Like, exactly. I, I told you this. I'm like, correct. 
So Where? Show it to me. It's, it's like, it's, text yeah. number 133. There you and go. Yeah, I was like, I, I don't, I'm going to go sleep. No, I, it's uh, it's definitely frustrating. And we've, and a lot of communication happens during the project. Mm -hmm. And that is, amounts to hours and days and days of like communication, yeah. right? From all means. So we want to make it more efficient. So that red book allows everybody to know what the project is all about and get the specific details of it. It also includes some pricing information yeah. because pricing is the one part that's kind of like mystical. Like, yeah. hey, how much does things cost? And so we make it easy because if you get down to like from a fixture level of hey, this fixture costs X amount of dollars, yeah. it still doesn't have a frame of reference. So what we do to our you know uh, clients, like the ones that we're working with, you are one of your clients, we want to give them a budget allowance and say, typically... Mm -hmm. For this allowance, these are the kind of fixtures that you can expect. Mm -hmm. So now they have a reference. Okay, should we increase it or do you think we'll be okay? Yeah. And that's that gives them like a mental like it's it's no longer some some challenge in their head that right. they've not seen or like experienced what that is about. So and then we also like if you if you noticed, we're trying to listen to the end home buyer figure out what their concern is. For some people, it's, is this going to cost a lot? For some, some people, people, it's like literally the, yeah, everything. And for some people, it's like, how long is this going to take? There's like all the range mm -hmm. of concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So we put them at ease right away by attacking that part first yeah. and giving them the answers, get them to a level of like comfort and then throw more information at yeah. them. Because if you don't address all the underlying concerns that they have, the information that you're sending out to them, it just gets passed over. It's right. just like it's flying over their head because they're still not met that concern that they have in their head. So cost, time, and effort. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it going to take? And we give them pretty realistic about them. It's like so sometimes people are not ready to buy a home. Mm -hmm. The biggest myth that is about real estate is everybody thinks they're ready to buy a home. They're not. Mm -hmm. Some people are not even ready to buy a condo because it comes with certain responsibilities that you may not have the time for. Yep. That's why it's not a good fit. So really evaluate the reasons for buying a home. For some people, it's a very emotional thing. And in that case, I, I stand back because no matter what I say to them, it doesn't matter. They want a home, we will give them the home. And we want to also know what are the features that they want so that that is different that we've not done before. So yeah. we're able to like focus on that because the elements of the home remain the same. And we are like really figuring out why do you want to build a home? What is it about yeah. this home? So when you understand that, that's why I bring my architect brain in because mm -hmm. I'm interfacing with them as if I was dealing with a design client. Right. And then from there, they transition into my partner does the, the uh, whole pricing and all of that. Yeah. So it becomes like real, right? It starts off with like, what is my dream home to yeah. like, that's why we call our company Real View, because we're giving them the realistic view of like what things cost and right. how things can be made. That. So um, from that standpoint, all I would say is um, I've, I caution people a lot from saying, stay away from the custom home process unless you really have a strong reason it's for more sophisticated like somebody who've been through a few projects yeah. before to know what to expect then they're ready for it for most of the others what we specialize in is called a semi-custom model yeah where they've come into one of our homes they like it which is what your clients are pretty right. much doing yep they like the basis of what we have come up with and then they want to take the exact same thing somewhere else in a location of their choice that you find as a realtor and then we just make small modifications so that essentially the home is the same, yeah. but customized to them. Yeah. And it takes away a lot of the decision-making process. Yeah. From you know, I think in a city like Chicago that has very specific lots, yeah. right? There's some longer, some little wider, but in, on average, you have a 25 by 125, 25, right? Correct. So there's only so much you can do in this, correct, in this specific location in regards to maximizing square footage and having a very good layout, yeah. right? Um, I think what people have to understand is that when they are looking to buy a, a new construction home or, they, or, or they're thinking about it, right? They also have to understand like what, what is their restrictions when it comes to where yeah. they're looking to buy yeah. and then going into what's the catalog of options that I have, sure. right? 
um, if you go to the full custom, 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 it's right. like, yeah, sure. Like you can go and I'm assuming like there's an online database where you sure. can maybe buy some plans or yep. whatever. And, you know, kind of really go into like crazy right. design or whatever. Yep. But at the end of the day, I think that the most successful methodology for a new construction buyer in Chicago, from what I've seen that get maximizes their return is that what has been done that you can repeat that. You know, what I've seen with you, for example, right. with, with your houses, you're like, well, you know, as we kept building, now we're like 90 times over, we realized, right. for example, like that bathroom, right, on the first yep. floor. It's like there's this landing that wasn't all that usable yep. in regards to the space. So then you, it, just as you go up from the first floor up to, as you're going up to the Two top, steps up. and you're like, because you're an architect, you're like, yep. well, then we did a half bath there. Right. And that's like a really good, nice, usable space. And I'm walking through there and I'm all about the flow sure. and the way the spaces are being used. And I immediately uh, figured and saw that and I was like, that's ingenious. Yeah. But you, ha you, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And a lot of people, and that's the, my, my saying, my favorite saying in Chicago, in, in real estate in general, is that you don't know what you what you don't know. And right. unfortunately, um, I told you so is the worst statement in real estate because everybody's already lost by that. point, yeah. Right. Um, you know, when when I go up for a listing or sure. or, or a buyer I'm working with, was like, well, my, my cousin just gone to real estate. I feel bad. I'm like, you don't know what you don't know yet. Yeah. Right. And when I tell you, I told you so because you you yeah. overpaid on this house or you had a terrible experience. When I said I told you so, it doesn't feel good to me. Yep. You're pissed because because yep. you don't want to hear it. And everybody, it's the same thing with 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 new construction. It's like, yep. you know, they have to understand the whole process, the flow, but also the builder that they that they yep. are using has to know what they're building and where. You can't just you know. That's why my number one question whenever I talk to new builders is like, what is your catalog? And if they're like, well, I've built one or two houses, I'm like, that's not enough. That's no. That's nowhere near enough. Yep. Like I need to know that you have the experience yep. because. The more, the less experience that the builder has, you the more, to, yeah, the yeah, more experience more. I have to have, and I ain't no builder, you know. Right, I, I get it. And so, from, from there are different builders, obviously in Chicago. So yeah. many of them, most of them. I mean, they, I give a good rap for all of them, but only because I've seen the the best builders. I've walked to the job sites and I have good yeah. relationship with a lot of them. Our goal is always try to be the best builder we can be and exceed the expectations, yeah. right? From a customer service standpoint. And what happens is their builder could be good, but their expectations of the clients or the home buyers were not conveyed up front to them. Yes. And there is a mismatch. Mm -hmm. So the builder thinks I have to build the best home possible with the best finishes. Well, they didn't communicate that they don't have enough money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now the intentions are good that they want a good home, but they can't afford it. So it leads to like, well, what do you have to cut back? Right. And the and this and happens at the end good. of the process. Oh, when you were the client is like about to have the most fun. They're able to like buy things that they can see, touch, use yeah, every right. day. Yeah. And they're too far in the process for them to stop. And now the builder has to make that that worst have you know have the worst conversation about hey guys you're over budget and now come up with the money or we'll have to like stop the project or do mm -hmm. something else we actively try to avoid that yeah so by saying yeah here's the budget Mm -hmm. Let's go through it very, mm -hmm. very detailed and see what's included, what's yeah. not included. Let's make sure that all the bases are covered. And we'll also include the contingency with the de healthy amount so that if in case stuff happens, you have that money for your, you know, for your own, yeah. you know, change of mind decisions, you know, and they can be paid for from the contingency. Yeah. Part. So a lot of these things are expectations. Yeah. So the expectations are not fully met for some reason, because there's not enough of a communication yeah. up front and through the process, mm -hmm. basically. So I say we excel at communication or we try to only because we found that the worst of mistakes can be avoided with the simplest yeah. of conversations, right? So I think I've stressed that a, a lot because that's one thing the industry is kind of lagging behind is that are at level and efficiency of communication, which we are trying to like change, yeah. hopefully for the better. Yeah, um, I, I think our industry is never going to get there with communication. I, they, 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 I, ever since day one of this business, my my whole like, everybody's been patting me on my back. All these clients are like, man, you communicate so well. I'm like, that's literally like the baseline <laughs> yes. of success yeah. in any sort of sales. But like, but I've been for my entire career has always been like, man, you're so good at communicating. Yeah. I'm like, 
I, thanks. Yeah. But I just literally answer my phone and I yeah, talk and I have very clear conversations, transparency. But um, unfortunately, that is the truth. Yeah. Um, that you know, communication is just an issue. Let's go to budgeting, right? Because sure. I think a lot of people that are interested in buying new construction also they just don't know what they don't know in regards to cost, right? Right. Can you build a new construction home in Chicago underneath, like all in? Can you be in for a less than a million dollars? Do you think? I think I. I absolutely. First of all, you know, I without the w- with land buy with land, you know, it depends. So we have you, you know about our process. We have three different models, mm-hmm. like a small, medium, large. Right. The smallest home is three thousand square feet, including the basement square footage. The medium is about thirty five to thirty six hundred, yeah. and the large is forty two hundred square feet. So. Depending on which location as a developer, also, you know, we decide to deploy one model versus the other because it makes financial sense and from a comparable perspective as well. You know, we used to regularly sell homes uh, for like 750, 800, right? I didn't know that. Yeah. Like I was also like, we were also the top builders in Humboldt Park in 2021, I believe. Mm. We sold like, I mean, we we built, we, dis- we bought, designed, built, and sold so many homes that it was a common play. And now Humble Park is especially difficult because they had have they have these uh, ordinance where they're trying to discourage people from building single family homes. And there were very very specific streets and sides of streets that you can build because of these ordinances. And I figured out as the architect which blocks they were. And I was able to like capitalize on that information yeah. and go in and buy pro- buy land at like pretty cheap, and we we bought we bought land for one hundred fifty thousand wow. dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, less than sub two hundred thousand. It's like almost impossible to think of right now, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. we changed the block. Yeah. Previously, nobody would envision a new construction home there. Now, their new construction, it uplifted the values of everybody in the block. Right. So I feel it is possible. Um, you have to be realistic with location. Yeah. So where you are sourcing your land from and how much you pay for the land. You know, cost of construction, it can be asked for a frame construction, can be asked less as like, you know, $175 a square foot and can go up. Even and, now. Yeah, even now. Because... I can still do stuff without all the bells and whistles, yeah. right? I can establish a home and not finish certain as- aspects of it because I don't need it to be finished right now. The basement, most people don't really use the basement, but they want a basement, okay. right? So it can be semi-finished. So all of these, there are different ways in which you can really like, you know, st- shoestring budget, you can make it work. Yeah. But then most people want everything finished and that's when there is an expectation, right? Okay. So what are you expecting to build for under a million dollars? What does that expectation yeah, right. look like? Based on that, I feel like, you know, depending on some locations and some neighborhoods within the city, you definitely can achieve, you know, that price point okay. to be under the price point. Now, when it comes to liquidity that somebody should have come ready for, right? You typically, if you're not buying this thing cash, yep. right? You need about... 20% for the total project cost, right? Because you go to a bank and they're going to give you the new construction budget yep. where it's like, let's say it's um, just to keep it simple, $100,000 for the land, um, uh, $900,000 for the build. Yep. So that's a million dollars. So as a uh, buyer, you should be ready for down payment of about $200,000. $200, Is that right? I would go and go a little bit more. So 25%. 25, okay. So if the down payment is let's say 20%, yeah. you would budget for 25. Right. Because okay. you need to have some liquid cash with you mm-hmm. just in case of something comes up. Right. Always contingency, like in every situation yeah. that involves some, some kind of construction. So um, I would say, number one, talk to your first line of defense is a very good lender. Yeah. Because a lender basically will tell you whether you're truly prepared for this project or yeah. not from a financial perspective. Sure. And that's sure. the most important one. Right. From that point, you know, you get pre-qualified and then once you get pre-qualified, you're looking around from a realtor, someone like you to kind of help them find a land. Yeah. And as soon as they identify the land, you have the services of a builder or an architect like me, because we are like trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And what is it that they want as a client? And is that possible for a particular budget or not? We can easily get that figured out 
within a day, yeah. so, so to speak. Yeah. So even if you're under contract, before your attorney review period gets over, you've pre-qualified in some from financial basis, from a zoning perspective, and right. from a building cost perspective. So essentially, if you have a very good builder on your side and a good realtor with and the lender, these p- three people basically can f- figure out a lot of the information up front so you don't even like go into the right. you know process of yeah, buying right. and all of that. Once that p- process is like figured out and you say you feel comfortable, the next step is permits and you know getting hard numbers from the builder and going to the actual construction yeah. itself. Timeline from demo, not even like let's call it contract. from like contract yeah. to let's say that same day you can you can start pulling for permits. From like that start to I'm moving in and popping bottles with Prashant. When God, when, when is so, that? Um, I I always tell this to all my realtor friends because call me as as an architect as soon as you identify the property, yeah, even yeah. before you go under contract. Right. Because I can save you a lot of time and right. make you look good. Right. So from my perspective, it starts when the land is buildable. That's day one. Right, you've identified that okay, everything is good with this land, piece of plot or tear down, whatever the case may be, and we're ready to go. Yeah. Then you go under contract. When you go under contract, you also write in the contract that you would be applying for building permits while under contract, and that is an that is something that I do for my clients because I know that I've qualified them that they're serious about it. That sure. they're not going to waste my time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I go through the permit process while they're in contract. Mm-hmm. So they're not waiting after they've you know closed on it and then waiting for X and more. In the city of Chicago, you cannot apply for a building permit if you're not the owner. You cannot get a building permit for a project if you're not the legal owner of the property. Why? The city also does a debt check on you, revenue ah. if you owe. So right there, it'll stop the process. So what I say is we get as far as we can and then we stop right there close and then finish the permit process, which could be a week or two Mm -hmm. after that. Once you start from that point onward, we've been averaging between nine, nine to 10 months. Which is incredible. Yeah. So because we have a process, right? And everything is follows the process and we're building the similar homes everywhere. So all our workers know what to expect, what to do. So just for the sake of argument, I would say allow yourself a good 12 months, which is typically what the loan terms are. And then you are, you try to be done much before then. Yeah. So we tell our clients 12 months, but then we, we are going to try and get it done in 10. And if we come less than that, they're like super thrilled. So you need liquidity. Yeah. You need time, right? You need a good team. Like yeah. those are kind of like your, solid. your three, three solid things. And then the mindset, right? Yeah. Of understanding yeah. what you're getting yourself into. Correct. Um, one thing I'm looking extremely excited about with our project is that process from once the current tenants move out to one of the trust we're gonna have a sledgehammer party <laughs> it's good you in you in yeah. for that i don't know i want to see i've talked i've talked to, I I wanna, I, talk I, to my insurance agents about that <laughs> i want to see Prashant with the sledgehammer going nuts <laughs> finally just getting all of that aggression out you're, yeah sure you're too nice and, and smiley i gotta i gotta get you angry no <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> um the only person i get angry about is myself and uh, nobody ever sees it but yeah. that's good okay, that's good i'll join the party no, good I'll good good party. yeah um so how have you seen in your, because you've been building for seven years. Yeah. Um, how have you seen trends change um, and um, the, like the overall new construction, like how did the pandemic affect you? Like I, I'd love to hear about, you know, the, like the way that just like behavioral in buying new construction has changed. So people want open spaces. That's mm-hmm. what the pandemic really like, you know, changed, shifted the real estate industry from people who were previously condo buyers turned into single family home buyers. And I feel like that's one of the reason, biggest reasons why the yeah. pandemic shifted real estate in a big way. And we were building homes like left hands. In fact, the bulk of our 90 homes that we built came during the pandemic because mm-hmm. we were building that we couldn't stop. Like we, yeah. we were constantly, yeah. Like so, and we couldn't build them fast enough because even though there was like, you know, material delays and all of that, we found a way to kind of like get them done, Yeah. right? So I would say the biggest shift in new construction in over the, since I've been starting to do it is people identify a little bit more with new construction now as it is a product type, a home type that will have less worries. I don't have to worry about it yeah. because the last thing you want to do is 
pay all these enormous sums of money and then come and find a problem inside yeah. our house, right? Uh, we actively try to mitigate that by going the extra step and say, hey, it's time to change your furnace filters yeah, right. because that's the one thing that everybody forgets yeah, right, yeah. three months into the home because they're all excited and then the furnace stops working and they're like, hey, Fernando, Prashant, my furnace, like what's going on? Yeah. Oh, builder's warranty. Yeah, I'm right. like, can you just pop out that filter and send us a picture? And this is like this dirty yeah, filter, it's like, right? It's, so and I'm it's like, choked. okay, we'll come and take take care of it for you. Don't worry about it. But, you know, we try to make things as simple as changing the filter, right? Mm -hmm. Because in new constructions that you shouldn't have to worry about how your home is functioning and all of that. You should know you should know what to expect. Yeah, and we do a good job of like telling them, "Hey, you're going to experience this. Don't get alarmed. Yeah, this is probably because of something that you did like here, and we can show you ways in which you can mitigate that." Um, sometimes, uh, in spite of that, mistakes do happen. Things don't work. We do a good job of going and fixing them right away. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's an emergency for no fault of ours, but yeah. it is still an emergency. We still go and fix it yeah. because we are there. We don't want our product to, you know, be looked at as negative, yeah, right? Yeah. Someone's home. So all of these things make new construction a much superior product. Yeah. And it has been exacerbated by the fact that during the pandemic, people wanted large spaces. So we were able to fit them into single family home lots, regardless of the size of the home. So that's what we've been doing. And that's why we're sticking to this model. I feel like it works that... If you have the budget for it, definitely consider the yeah. new construction home as opposed to a renovated home. Well, I mean, just going back to my point before is like, you can, like I've had buyers that I've been searching with for years at this point, two years, three years. And I'm like, how much longer are you, like you obviously are able to wait. So like, if you can give me another 12 months, I can get you into a single family home, brand new construction, right? Like those are the kind of conversations where people sure. are just like, create your own, market create your yeah. like and and it's like it's really eye-opening to people where they're like it's not even an option that they had before which you know is, is, is shocking to me but also it's like it's pseudo education on brokers end as well yeah, right absolutely um and i think that like like anything else it's a segment of real estate that not a lot of like brokers that don't like when we just natural human new human instinct is like if we don't know something or we or, or we shy away from it and we don't think of it as an option right yeah. short sales is a great example for yep. you know when when the, the yep. whole market was going up and down but the, some realtors that were great at it they killed, yep, killed it, it right yep. um so and then i remember i still remember my first short sale deal and i i called some people and then i was like oh this isn't so bad and it's just right. a matter of timing right. and this is how you negotiate and then it's like boom like a whole new skill set after you're done, you're done with the first yeah. one. You feel like you, you guys do should do that. You guys should do some like you know educational like with with brokers just to kind of because like, it'll almost help you with your yeah. Like I've been man. doing this. I enjoy these conversations because it's bringing two related professions together. Yes, right? true. Two related professionals yeah. together, and from my standpoint, like for example, just as a you know, uh, as a piece of knowledge right now that everybody should know, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois energy codes have changed. So now the entire home has to be spray foamed. Okay. You cannot use regular fiberglass inf insulation. Yeah. So I have found that out recently because the city has started enforcing that particular section of the Illinois state code in the city of Chicago. Even though it's not really like inspected for, on the plans we have to show double the insulation was what previously was required. So you can no longer stuff regular fiberglass insulation in between the studs and comply with code. Now you have to spray foam. Now that is going to lead to, well, a cost right. you know, conversation, but it's going to make their home so much more efficient right. that they're going to initially eventually save money. But we also have to like, look at how the home is breathing. So yeah. we have to like accommodate for that by adding fresh air intakes which means the home's always getting a supply of fresh air yep. in spite of the home being closed from a window and a door perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But otherwise, the home is not breathing. Yeah, so, right. So you want to make sure that those will become the standard. It's the, besides a furnace, you have a box called an HRV or, you know, it's an energy, energy basic, it, it recovers the energy, right? This is a, just a small box. What it does is it takes the bad air from the furnace filters it or takes it out of the house and then it takes the fresh air from the outside, filters it and feeds it into the furnace. 
So there's always a pressure. And it's a small box. It just hung on the ceiling. Those will become the norm. You will start looking at homes yeah. in these in the next few years. You're going to see a furnace and you're going to see this box, which mm -hmm. is the energy, the energy recovery ventilator, right? So you as a realtor are going to pay attention because now it's become the norm. It's yeah, no right. longer an option that you know you can have new construction. So that is how there is a sh there's going to be a fundamental shift in the way realtors perceive new construction. Yeah, and not just like regular renovation projects, but specifically new construction because the rules apply are more stringent for new construction as opposed to renovation. Of course. So that's why it's going to become even more desirable project type or a home type. Yeah. for people to go buy into because they don't need to worry about being future, you know, whether they're they're going to be, their house is going to be efficient enough and all yeah. of that. All of that is met automatically. Have you guys thought about all of the energy efficiency style housing, right? Where it comes to like um, solar panels and all of the stuff that's like, you know, preparing for um, climate change and yeah. all, all of that. Like how are you, how do you guys hedge your projects for the world of the future. So I'm, you know, I'm very opinionated about this, and sometimes it's not the good, of the best because climate change is fake. No, <laughs> so I would not. I would not go. I wouldn't go that far. But uh, no, I I do believe climate change is real, and we have to do some. Each, mm -hmm. you know, individual has to do yeah. their part, right? Yeah. As an architect, I kind of differ a little bit because. Everybody talks about going green, but they don't talk about what the cost of going right, green. Right, yeah, exactly, yes. And there is, you know, at a fundamental level, you change your light bulbs, you're green, right? Because your LED light bulbs are more efficient and they, you know, yep. draw less power. Yes. So you're still green. But you have to determine what is the balance that is right for you based right. on your financial ability. The green, the going green might look different for someone who doesn't have the resources. Yeah, right. And the going green might look for someone as solar panels as being a luxury, right? Because True, yeah. and they may not have they may have the money, but their house is not supportive of the the weight required for sure. the structural uh, you know components required for supporting the solar panels. So it is a case by case basis. In a new construction, our structure is prepared for handling solar panels, and what we also do is we give them the option of will run a conduit from the panel all the way to the roof. And that way it's solar ready. You don't need to ever come back later and mm. poke holes around the home yeah. and all that. You want to give them the option of educating them, but leaving them to make the choice. Do you want to do this right now or do you want to be ready for it? Sometimes they may say, no, I don't want to do it at all. And that is being, that shows like a little bit of a failure on our professionals part that we've not conveyed them enough the importance and the urgency of you know sure. the energy upgrades because you're not asking them to do the energy upgrades you're asking them to be prepared for it and that's a big difference so as a realtor it, and as an architect and as a builder it is our duty to kind of convey and kind of like really convey yeah. the importance of being prepared for these energy changes yep. and uh, the efficiency uh, changes versus forcing something upon them with a the bill, right? So that's the difference. I feel like that communication is not quite balanced and nuanced yet. But I feel like until, like anything else, I feel like until the economic impact is truly beneficial to their pocketbook, they're not going to shift over. It's just, it's, I feel like- 100%. Right, like it's-, yeah. it's They're not going to make that, they, they probably will even question why are you forcing me to put this conduit to the roof? I don't never going to do solar panels. Right. Then you say, by doing this and being solar ready, when come time to sell your home, and when I say in the MLS solar ready home, it's going to determine your home is going to stand out better than a, mm -hmm. a, a competitor's home. That could hopefully change their mind a little yeah. bit, kind of see. Like our goal is to educate. We can never force people to do. At the end of the day, we can only give our best advice yeah. and then hope that the 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 home buyers or your clients are listening to you, right? Yeah, right. And take and make the right decisions. But I feel like we owe it to them to just them. Like, okay, just change your light bulbs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's just start there. That's we... like you know, just change your light bulbs, and that's that's a good start. Yeah. And let them make. You want to inspire them to like go, go do the right thing and to recite. People don't like being lectured. That's the part, right? You know, like I can't be like this green god and go tell them I'm the architect. Go do this. Yeah, right. 
they're all like, who are you? I mean, there was a trend though, like in the South side, at least yeah. like Bronzeville, there was like, like, you know, the whole green trend. It's like, you don't really hear about it, which is, uh, which is upsetting. Cause it was like, I was like, oh, this is great. Like, you know, it's kind of becoming a thing. Um, but I bet the economics just didn't work out. So there is the, the greenwashing movement, which is basically throwing a bunch of stuff on top of, you know, the building and everything, yeah. and then say it's green. And then there's the green living, which is, you have to, and there's sustainable living. So sustainable living is you're trying to enforce kind of like a floor plan level, you know, way of efficient living. Most people have way too much space that they need. So they yeah. accumulate more stuff and then they, you know, go and try to, and they run out of place and then they go and buy another home that's bigger and accumulate more stuff. If you're able to figure out what is the least amount of space that you can get someone to live comfortably as an investor, building someone for rent, mm -hmm. for rental, or someone as you as a homeowner, I think you can achieve a lot. So I think you should start there and then go on to adding the green features based on the fundamental economics of yeah. the project. Got you, got you. Now, kind of going back to when you identify lots, yeah. what, when you look, when you look for your own projects, right? Yeah. What is it that you look for in an ideal lot? Like what, what's your like, man, that's, that's gold. Yeah, this is our secret sauce, but you know, I guess, you know, Come on. I would love to share it because I'm the esteemed headquarters of Vesta. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I, it's, uh, it's, we do a lot of common sense stuff in the sense that me and my partner will stake out the property in different times of the day. Oh yeah, yeah. Because, and then I like to look at Google's feature on, you can go back and look at the same property on a Google street view in multiple years. Sure. See what Smart. different changed. And because I'm picking up some clues from what the available information. I do that from an architect from desktop level, right? And then from the street level, we go sit in there, we look for, we're looking for stuff. What is happening? How are people moving around the property? And is, are there people who are loud? And because we are evaluating for a financial, you know, project as opposed to just a building project. Right. Those things are very important. So definitely, you know, visit the site at different times of the day mm -hmm. and different times of the week. Mm -hmm. And that will put your mind at ease that you're making the right decision. That's number one. Number two, how close are your neighbors yeah, to right. your lot? Because that's going to affect, as you know, you know, we have to make sure we, you know, we do what's called shoring and bracing to protect the neighboring foundations. Good old shoring, right? So uh, shoring is a very controversial subject, but it is something that all builders have to do because without that, you will not get a building permit. You're giving the city a shoring plan that's drawn by a structural engineer, and then you, the excavator and the concrete contractors, follow the plan. And they protect the neighboring foundations. Quite on, quite often, this is an expensive part, but it's a necessary cost because you're not really giving, getting something for your money. You're protecting the neighbor's foundations. Yeah. So uh, you go through that, and then just by looking at it visually, yeah. if the neighboring homes are too close to your property lines, you can anticipate that your shoring costs are going to be higher than normal. <laughs> If they're far away from you, chances are you can get away with some kind of, you know, shoring that is not metal and expensive shoring. It's sure. like less expensive wood shoring, like a plywood shoring sure. or something like that. So those are all things that we are picking up cues on. And then the last thing is, uh, we're also looking for your neighbors, right? Who are the neighbors? Yeah. <laughs> are they going to be tough on us as a builder? Oh, sure. Because, you know, we just go to, you know, just stand around there, automatically they'll come out. And they'll talk to us. Oh, what are you guys doing? Yeah, and right. That's usually a good sign for us because sure. they're watching out for you, right? Right, 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 right. And we just tell them, hey, we're considering buying the property. Do you have any? And they give us a lot of information. Yeah. Oh, don't you know about this? And they start like, because people love to talk, right? Yeah, right. And we're also checking for hazardous substances like asbestos and, you know, lead and all that, if we can, from a visual perspective. If the home is a teardown and it's like, a, it's a very old, you can expect that you can spend between, Eleven to fifteen thousand dollars in, uh, you know, hazardous material remediation. Sure. So you add that to part of your, you it's know, like contract removable. as yeah. well, and say if these materials are found, you would give us a credit for X amount of dollars. Sure, got it. Because then you don't want to get stuck with the bill later right. on. So those are all the things that we're looking for from a very strategic point for a basis. From a zoning perspective, we look at what is the zoning district, how much can you build, what are we building, who are the comps, and all of that. And then from a, um, from a permit perspective, we're looking for 
are we doing the highest and best here? And what would it take, mm -hmm. right? And what information do we, how long do we anticipate the permit process to take? But I think you, that, that's a really important last piece of, piece of the process because you don't want to build a $3 million house when the, when the, the highest expensive house that's closed is in the last, you know, whenever has been 1.5. So build for the locations. But also if the prices are starting to come up, Right. You can shoot ahead, but again, that's where the professions come in, right? Like the, Correct. That, 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 that's that's why you as a realtor's yeah. role is all the more essential because you're advising your, your clients saying, you might want to think about not being the biggest home or not being the smallest home, but the right one. Yeah. Which suits your lifestyle and, you know, kind of takes into account your yeah. future family growth. So, um, however, you know, there is a case to be made in certain neighborhoods to build the biggest home where the prices are already very expensive you know they're like all the homes that are being built are the biggest homes yeah you want to match them you don't want to go there and build the smallest sure. home because you will suffer financially right so there is like that's why the realtor's role is especially important because they can help kind of shape the initial direction of the yeah project. gotcha and Prashad, I could keep talking for like right. the next three hours in this. It's incredible. <laughs> do, right? But, I, but I, I think that, um, you know, we got the, the meat of it. I yep. think um, I'd love to have you back on and kind of more talk about the nitty gritty. But if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Um, look me up. My name is quite difficult, but my Fernando, Fernando, my partner's name is quite easy. And our company's name is Real View. Uh, design and development or website is realviewdd.com. Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest, right? Yeah. You and, um, you know, a Google search on my name is also another. Yeah, way to get and, and we'll, we'll put the little things on, Thank on, you. on on the YouTube. But yeah, if you're working on our website too, but at the same time, you know, I generally speaking, you want to name check a few references, right? Yeah. Like, do you know of this architect and all that? Chances are, a lot of I've worked with a lot of realtors and a lot of contractors in the past, my architectural career. I'm so, obviously your favorite. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, you know, so we want to get <laughs> <laughs> you. Want, you want to get some uh, come name recognition going as well. So definitely ask around people True. before you select an architect and a builder and who you decide to work with. Prashant, my oh, man. Thank you. Pleasure. Greg. Thank you for coming in, man. Absolutely. All right, man. I honestly, I could have talked for like another three hours. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah.